Following a short hallway south, we emerged within a large, circular chamber, its walls dark and thousands of glowing dots somehow affixed to the domed ceiling perhaps portraying the night sky. A moment later, I recognized that there were crude drawings painted upon the walls as well, humanoid silhouettes that appeared both featureless and mysterious. A simple stone altar appeared transfixed within the exact center of the chamber, circular in shape and containing a variety of smaller creatures that typically inhabited the underground, rats, toads, bats, snakes and so forth, none of which appeared to be alive. A tall, strangely decorated feline approached, some sort of cleric or even witch doctor it seemed. My first impression here was that the room was dedicated to the religion of the feline and I sensed sadness, even despair. It was the first time I had been exposed to any sort of religious or spiritual perspective from the feline and I was rather surprised, given how dark and gloomy the chamber was. The feline cleric welcomed us to their meditation chamber where the feline came to think, pray and reflect upon their existence. Despite the welcome, I felt uncomfortable within the chamber and I was not about to let my guard down. Heroes from above, the mysterious witch doctor began, apparently aware of where we had come from. You trespass on sacred ground. I beg you, turn around and depart this place at once. The religious figure wasn't threatening us at least, so I was fairly sure I could ask a single question. Can you tell us the location of Flavit and Feria? Yes, I know the whereabouts of Flavit, beyond the door to the east, the feline cleric replied, looking in that direction. He knows what is best for our kind and how to exact our revenge against the humans above, so you need to let him be. The strange witch doctor continued to stare at us, taking a step forward before continuing. Now, please, return from where you came, this does not have to end badly for you, the priest warned, his tone somewhat stronger. We will not let you pass. We? Eswin asked, looking about. The cleric turned, mumbled some archaic words and raised his arms. Moments later, dark, shadowy creatures slowly emerged from the various drawings on the walls. Translucent, incorporeal beings that hovered just above the floor, they soon surrounded us, black beings that sent a chill down my spine. The feline shadow gods will not be disrespected, the priest declared, turning to us again. Now, either leave or be drained by these gods. Attempting to negotiate, I asked that the shadowy beings stand down so we could bargain in good faith. The feline priest only ignored me, however, preparing for imminent combat. Why must you outsiders believe you can always have your way with us? The feline cleric barked, clearly upset. Now, feel the wrath of our feline shadow gods. The witch doctor began preparing a spell as the black, shadow monsters attacked, each of them trying to merely touch us. Kartha leaped toward the cleric, but before she could reach him, he cast hold person on her, immobilizing the mutant for the remainder of the battle. Worse, one of the shadows touched Ariana, draining away a little of her strength. The same thing happened to Eswin, then myself, these monsters weren't actually undead but each attack left us a little weaker. Despite the magic of the cleric and the near dozen of the shadowy monsters, we eventually defeated the entire lot, the feline whispering to us as he passed into unconsciousness. Your victory is short-lived, as are all of you. Now what? Ariana asked, my heroes alone within the dark chamber. There is another door to the east. Kartha proclaimed, the woman no longer magically held and now pointing in that direction. That must be where Flavit has taken the Sislan cleric. It's locked. Eswin shouted in frustration a few moments later, trying the door. We're going to need some sort of key to pass through. Searching the altar, we poked around the creatures lying about, all of which were dead, and perhaps rendered that way as some sort of dark sacrifice by the feline witch doctor here. About to give up, Ariana then spotted a bit of stone protruding from under one of the dead creatures, it appeared to be some sort of key. The elf grabbed the item and handed it to me, black as night and its edges serrated like a knife. As hoped, the key fit the eastern door perfectly and unlocked it, opening the way forward. With no time to lose, we pushed past the door and into another hallway beyond. Following a short tunnel east, we found an open doorway and peered beyond, being careful not to be seen. The chamber was extremely large, at least 100 yards to a side, with a shallow pit dominating the center of the area. The walls seemed to contain barred alcoves, likely individual crypts. Shackled to an elaborate stone post before the pit was who I presumed to be Feria, we had found her. 
However, a tall, strong feline had just restrained her within the iron shackles as half a dozen loyal feline soldiers looked on. Moments later, the primary feline, Flavit I presumed, unsheathed his short sword and, using both hands, held the weapon up high, apparently about to thrust it deep into the cleric and slay her on the spot, I only had seconds to act. No. I shouted at the top of my lungs, surprising everyone within the chamber beyond and causing them to look in our direction. As we approached, the feline here readied their weapons and took defensive positions around both Flavit and Feria, the female cleric almost in a state of shock and unable to communicate. Extremely wary, Flavit held his short sword up to Feria's throat, ready to slay her at a moment's notice. Who are you? The feline leader demanded to know, looking us over thoroughly. Your father Rustinian sent us, Red Fern returned, bravely addressing the feline. He says enough is enough. It's time to surrender the Sislan cleric and help him negotiate a truce with the city above. Flavit didn't seem nervous or scared, just very angry, and I sensed that he was truly ready to slay the cleric right here and now. I therefore had to be very careful with how I interacted with Flavit to have any hope of saving Feria. The humans should suffer as we suffered. Flavit cried out, as passionate as he was angry. And I will use their own dead against them. We want to end this peacefully, Kartha responded, almost ignoring Flavit's threat. We've come to negotiate, not to judge. That's all your kind does is judge. Flavit responded, so intensely angry. All of you think you know better, that you somehow have the right to enforce your will upon us. You don't, and it's time you suffered like we suffered. Feline, the way I see it, the Nasians above do perhaps deserve to suffer for what they've done to your people over the past few decades, S. Wynn commanded, his words passionate as well. Sure, kill the cleric and all the humans above and have your revenge, and then we will have to kill you and all your kind. Is that what you really want? How can any of you know anything of our pain? Flavit cried out, lowering his blade away from Faria's vulnerable throat as he raged against all of us. You humans think you're so strong and clever, that you can play god over all living things. For once, we now fight back. Kill them. And with that, the additional feline here hissed and cried out, Flavit's utter hatred having driven them into a near berserker state as they rushed us to attack. In addition to Flavit, himself a powerful warrior, five feline assassins, two feline champions and two feline magic users all tore into us, initiating a battle that lasted several minutes. But despite the odds, and all of us severely wounded, we somehow defeated Flavit and all his lackeys. The feline defeated, I immediately leaped over to where the cleric Feria was standing alongside the shallow pit, still shackled. Thank, thanks Sisley you found me in time. I really thought he was going to do it. Feria whispered, her fear and revulsion quite apparent. Supreme One. Sane ears called out, softly patting his chest twice and then holding out his right palm, the hallowed sign of Sisla. We came as fast as we could, are you injured? He was going to sacrifice me, Feria responded, still almost in shock. I took him in, helped his cause, tried to get the Nasian council to see reason, and he was going to sacrifice me. Are you able to travel? Eswin asked, recognizing the need to return Feria to the surface as quickly as possible. Not so fast, you human scum. You will soon be begging for death. Engaged in the rescue of Feria, I had failed to notice as Flavit dragged himself to the far edge of the shallow pit just 20 feet away, standing alongside one of his unconscious feline champions, his blade at the creature's throat. Surprised by the sudden turn of events, all we could do was watch as Flavit did the unthinkable to his own brethren, slitting his throat and pushing him into the pit where he had intended to sacrifice Feria. No. Feria cried, her eyes widening in horror. What is it? Sane ears asked Feria, not understanding. What's wrong? He's, he's awakening the dead. As I watched helplessly, the feline champion just sacrificed by Flavit began to vibrate at the bottom of the shallow pit, some sort of magical, evil force taking hold of him. The slain creature then shook violently as his corpse was magically torn apart, blood and bone and hunks of flesh suddenly scattered in all directions above us like spokes on a wheel. Moments later, the barred gates of the various crypts lining the walls of the sacrificial chamber exploded outward with such violence that we had to protect ourselves from being injured by the flying debris. The dust settled and the room became quiet, deathly quiet. 
still exhaling heavily from the recent battle with the feline, our breath began to condense in the sudden cold air, my party members producing a slight fog with each breath like on a cold winter's day. Faria then turned to me, her fear still very much apparent but a sudden determination also seen in her eyes. We need to fight together to survive this. Agreeing, I immediately invited Faria to join our party, adding yet another cleric to our cause. A mostly naked, snarling, grotesque humanoid creature then leaped out from its crypt, blood oozing from its jagged mouth and the beast clearly crazy for more. Another such creature jumped out, then another and another, until there were seven such monsters surrounding us, about to attack. Whites. Sane ears called out, appalled. These fiends drain life force, don't let them get you. The utterly horrific monsters then swarmed us, biting and ripping at our flesh like nothing we had ever encountered before. Between Sane Ears, Kartha, and now Feria, the clerics were able to turn away three of the whites, the monsters retreating to a far corner to be destroyed soon. But it took everything we had left to face and defeat the remaining four undead creatures, all of us somehow escaping the encounter with our lives' energy intact. We were then surprised by a final white, badly damaged but perhaps all the more dangerous. Likely sensing a much easier meal and flave it, the feline lying on the ground barely conscious and unable to defend himself, the white leaped in his direction, fangs out and ready to tear into his soft and unprotected flesh. As fate would have it, I happened to be closest to the attack and so only I could act in time. For a split second, my initial impulse was to let the white rend flave it to pieces, given what he was planning to do to Feria, and what we had just seen him do to his fellow feline. But then I remembered the promise made to his daughter Zissa to not let any harm come to him, despite what he had done to the humans above, to what he was going to do to Feria or even what he did to his own compatriot minutes ago, I thought twice about letting Flavit be destroyed by the white. My own altruism kicking in, I threw myself into the attacking white, my momentum causing the monster to just miss Flavit and sending both the white and me crashing to the floor. Landing hard and awkwardly, however, I was unable to deflect an initial attack by the white and I felt a horrible pain shoot through me as part of my life energy was drained away. Still, I did save the life of Flavit and, presuming the party would make it back to the surface alive, I would soon be able to look Sissa squarely in the eye and tell her that I personally brought her father back safe and sound, just as I had promised. The remaining white badly damaged, the party made short work of the monster before helping me to my feet, almost in awe of the sacrifice I had made to save the life of Flavit. Faria stepped to me and bowed in deep respect, then partially healed Flavit as well so that he could at least stand and walk. That was true heroism just now. Faria proudly stated, looking at me but then turning her head toward Flavit. Of all the wicked things you've done, and yet a complete stranger saved your life, losing a little of life as well in the process. What do you have to say for yourself now? While still angry, my incredible act of kindness was not lost on Flavit and he just kept his mouth shut. I then took the opportunity to simply ask Flavit to trust us, that with the help of Feria, Rustinian, and the rest of my adventuring party, I was sure something good would come out of all this. The feline awkwardly nodded just a bit, then looked away as to not concede anything further for now. We should head back. Sane Ears then suggested, recalling Rustinian's instructions as he turned to Feria. Supreme One, do you know the secret way back up to the Sislan Temple? You mean those stairs over there? The cleric returned, pointing into the far corner. Remarkably, an old stone staircase rose up into the darkness in the far northeastern corner of the chamber, unnoticed in all the confusion. Apparently, we now had a way to escape the underground feline dungeon. My party severely wounded. We first made camp and spent nearly half a day resting, healing, and recovering from our time within the feline tunnels, Flavit kept under close guard so he couldn't escape. We then climbed the stone stairs leading up. Reaching the surface again, Faria helped Eswin unlatch an old trap door that led into the cellar of the Sislan temple above, and a few minutes later we were standing within the basement of the temple. The cellar here was full of stored objects, some of which were covered in dusty sheets. Paying little heed, Faria led us all up another flight of stairs and into the main worship chamber of the temple. Waiting here were about a dozen humans in one corner of the temple, along with a dozen or so feline in another. Both sides eyed each other warily, as if preparing for a brawl and I suspected that they had all come to settle their differences with each other one way or another. Father. A young feline woman's voice suddenly shouted, almost piercing the air. Flavit's daughter Zissa rushed out of the group of feline standing some thirty feet away. 
While still angry with Flavit and what he had planned to do to Feria, I couldn't help but smile as Flavit took a few steps forward and allowed Zissa to run straight into his arms, the two very happy to see one another again. The embrace was long and sweet, and I soaked in the tender moment. You kept your word. Zissa cried. Yes, by keeping my word, and demonstrating that to all the feline here, I had done more to restore their trust in one selfless act than months of intense negotiations. Lord Rastinian then stepped from the small crowd of feline as well and approached, his look most serious. As he neared me, an older human stepped away from his own group, headed in our direction as well. I also kept my promise, restoring him and some of his staff, Rastinian whispered in my ear. But best not let him know about the leash and being treated as a pet cat and such, some things are best left unsaid. Recalling Lord Mason asleep on the palace room floor earlier, I couldn't help but chuckle as the older man walked slowly toward me his wrinkled brow betraying his angry mood. You there? What's going on? This Rastinian feline says you have all the answers. Before attempting to explain everything that had happened the past few weeks, I formally introduced myself and the party to Lord Mason, doing a rather poor job of it. Mason, in turn, demanded that I get straight to the point, what was going on? Father, this adventuring party was only trying to help, the cleric Feria interjected, taking command of the conversation. Without them, I wouldn't be standing here alive now. And with that, Faria spent the next ten minutes explaining to Lord Mason everything that had happened, how the feline reached sentience decades ago but were kept hidden away within their underground sanctuary, how they were poisoned and returned to the Nasian populace as their pets, or even slaves, how Flavit used the Sisland fear antidote to, in turn, poison the human populace and let the feline run amok, and how it was time now for both sides to move past their anger and find a way to live. Together in peace. Lord Mason listened intensely, trusting his own daughter completely. He then turned to me, wanting to know my own opinion regarding recent events. Despite all the chaos and hardship, this could all work out for the best, I suggested with a smile, speaking for the party. With just a little understanding and forgiveness on both sides, you could find enough common ground to move forward in peace. But they're just, feline, Lord Mason responded, still tone deaf to everything he had just heard. Surely you're not suggesting that they're some sort of equal to us? That's exactly what we're suggesting. Ariana scolded, herself used to being treated less than an equal due to her own racial heritage. Ariana about to continue, Faria held out a hand to quiet the elf, the priest firmly taking control of the conversation again. The feline are every bit our equals now and have been for some time. Most of the people here in Nace just chose to ignore it, and shame on all of you for that. The question is, what are you going to do about it now? Attempting to play on Lord Mason's sense of honor, I pushed the idea that formally proclaiming the feline as racial equals within Nace and all hope air wasn't just the right thing to do but the only thing to do. While my words were powerful, Lord Mason remained unconvinced, he just couldn't get past his own archaic, self-serving, racist beliefs. Recognizing this, Lord Rastinian joined the conversation, his own plea just as passionate as mine. Why is this so difficult for you humans? Rastinian began, the feline quite animated as he spoke. We walk and talk just like you. We bleed, worry, and suffer just like you. We dream, love our children, defend against our enemies, honor our dead, all, just like you. The only difference between us is that we don't look the same, but why does that matter so much? Why does that matter at all? Put aside your born and red racism and think about these poor creatures. Red Fern added, seeing so much potential for Lord Mason to explore here. Embrace what the feline have become, welcome them with open arms and go down in history as a great unifier. I don't think so, Lord Mason responded, still far from convinced that the feline should be treated as equals. Humans have always controlled the feline, that's just the way it is. Then there is resources, our food, our possessions, our wealth, there is not enough of it to share with all the feline as well. His daughter Feria about to rebuke him, Mason pointed at her as if condemning her, continuing his rant. And if we made the feline equals, there would be so much resentment here in Nace that it would lead to anger, fighting and even rebellion. If you're asking me what's best, I have to think about what all of us here in Nace want too. As Lord Mason seemed unconvinced by reason or passion, I reminded him that nothing important was ever gained easily and that to have the best in life, one must work the hardest to achieve it. 
However, at this point, nothing I could do or say was going to undo the centuries of racist thinking here. Lord Rastinian stared at Lord Mason for a few moments, then shook his head in disgust before turning to Faria. I knew these humans would never accept us. It looks like civil war is the only answer. And why should we not put all of you down for poisoning us and taking over our city? Mason complained, his original anger returning. All of this is your fault. Rastinian countered, matching Mason's outrage. We should have put all of you down when we had the chance these past few weeks. Maybe now we will finish the job. As the human and feline lords, along with their associated followers within the temple, prepared themselves for combat, we heard a deafening screech from out beyond the building, something that sounded horrific. A moment later, we spotted a flash of intense light through the stained glass windows of the temple, followed immediately by a nearby crash, as if something had just fallen from the sky. Recognizing the monstrous cries, the particular color of the fire and all the rest, I realized that several hellions had just crashed nearby and would certainly attack everyone here in Nace. All of us raced to the windows near the northwestern corner of the temple, looking beyond. Perhaps 100 yards away, we could see several buildings now on fire, feline scattering everywhere and the scene devolving into chaos. Then, to everyone's absolute horror, several flaming monsters emerged from the burning buildings, creatures I immediately recognized as hellions. Clearly, these fiends had escaped the evil root forest and had just crashed here, ready to spread their death and destruction. What in the name of Sisla? Lord Mason whispered in fear, never having experienced such monstrosities before. Well need to work together to survive this, I instructed both Mason and Rastinian, explaining that the only way to defeat the Hellions and save Nace at this point was for everyone to work together, humans and feline alike. The two lords looked at one another, utterly dumbfounded and unable to say anything. After one last glance through the windows, from which I thought I had spotted four, five, perhaps even six Hellions, my party turned for the temple exit, preparing ourselves for what would certainly prove to be a tremendous battle. Heading northwest from the Sislan temple, I simply followed the fire, smoke, and cries of terror, taking about ten minutes to arrive and confront the Hellions. Arriving at the scene, we found half a dozen buildings already on fire, thick smoke billowing upward. Frantic feline ran about everywhere as well, scared out of their minds and a few wailing over the bodies of their kin who were caught in the blast caused by the arrival of the Hellions and either rendered unconscious or killed. The scene quite chaotic, it took a few moments to wrap our minds around all the danger and mayhem. As I surveyed the pending battlefield, I soon counted six Hellions moving about, burning everything in their path. My heart utterly sank, there was no way our party could take on six of these Hellions by ourselves. Somehow, someway, we were going to need some help. Moments later, both Lord Rastinian as well as Lord Mason arrived alongside our party, having come to see the destruction for themselves. Neither had ever witnessed such monstrosities before, and it was all they could do to not turn and flee in terror. What, what are those? Things? Mason gasped, horrified beyond belief. And how do we stop them? Rastinian added, the feline also shaking in his boots. If we rally together, we can stop them. I suggested to my allies, trying to provide hope in what looked like a hopeless situation. While a noble and optimistic response, my party looked to me as if I had lost my mind, there was no way we could do this on our own. What kind of monsters are those? A feline voice asked just behind me. Turning around, standing there was Flavit, his daughter Zissa and perhaps half a dozen of his personal guard, the feline fearful of the Hellions beyond but still bravely prepared to do what they must. Surprised and perhaps a little relieved to see some potential warriors, S. Wynn quickly summarized the situation. They're Hellions, from the realm of nightmares, and they'll burn you horribly if you get too close. We have to defeat them somehow before they destroy the entire city, but we can't do it alone. And that's a wrap of episode number 18, of Fury and Sacrifice. Expect additional episodes every few weeks as the story continues. Looking for...